Good evening. Good evening. Dad says he's gotten better tonight. I work with him a little bit more this afternoon. That's why I'm yeah. Good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. We're glad that you're here. And so uh, we're excited, I am, to hear part two about the Beatitudes tonight. And so excited about that. Uh, this year is a little bit different. Uh, it's hard to revival. We're not taking up a love offering. Uh, we would just be doing that out of our budget. And so we won't have to worry about that tonight. Uh, also, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer now. So, But before we do, uh, any special prayer requests tonight? Jim Rand Jones, uh, Jerry Van, he's been at the ER all day. Thanks for got a bug or something. They've done a lot of tests on him, but he did get to come home. Jerry went to Walmart to get his medicine and didn't see him up the day. So he's all right. sick about all week. All right. Well, we'll uh, <coughs> be lifting up Ann. And uh, I got that this morning. I know we celebrated Jackson's graduation, but I got this this morning for Sabrina Brooks. Most people don't know who Sabrina is, do you? It's Paige. So, uh, so Paige is graduating, and, and I'll tell you, times sure have changed. So she's graduating high school with two different associate degrees already. <laughs> I mean, whew, about time sure have changed, ain't it? But uh, congratulations to her. Okay, um, any other prayer concerns? Talked to Matt this afternoon. Uh, That sure is a young age there, and I don't know why. Mm. All right. Well. Just remember by the end of this, it says travel down the road to the beach. Yeah, going down to the beach tomorrow, celebrate their 25th, and so that was enjoyable this afternoon. To, there was a whole lot of moon pies there, RC and moon pies. And, uh, so that's good. Anything else? Let's pray, and then uh, we're going to sing our songs. Miss Toy is here tonight. Uh, I know you're going to enjoy her, and then we're excited about part two. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that we have found in this day. Thank you for the rest, and we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you for the word that we heard this morning, and, and so encouraging. And we thank you, Lord. Uh, for the music that we had this morning. Such a blessing. Lord, we go, uh, or we come tonight uh, just to lift up additional prayer requests and, and some of the same ones, but Lord, we know our prayer sheet is just covered and full of names, and so we've got a lot to pray about. But Lord, tonight we pray for your will to be accomplished. We do pray for healing. We pray for answers. We pray for safety as folks travel. God, we just pray that your will will be done in our lives, in the life of our church here, and also the life of uh, Chestnut Dale as well. We appreciate our dear brother coming uh, and his family tonight, Lord, and we do lift up his church, Chestnut Dale. Those folks are precious people, and we love them, and, and we pray, pray blessings upon them as well. Lord, now as we go into our time of singing and, and praising you, Father, and then hearing the word, we'll just be quick to give you the glory and honor. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing hymn number 623, something beautiful.
and look forward to this. You have. <laughs> yes, I have. You not? It's been a struggle. Uh, I do. Well, I'm sure y'all remember uh, it was about a year or two ago. Yeah. It's been a while. She said it's the first church she's sang in about a year and a half. So it's been a while. So we might as well start off with this because it looks and everything only goes up from here. <laughs> I get pretty used from this view, seeing everybody, but uh, it can be challenging up here sometimes, but we, we appreciate you, we're praying for you. Thank you. Thank y'all for having me, uh, we appreciate it. And, um, to add to the hymns, I've, I've got a couple uh, to sing tonight, and I really, these two songs, they just, they fill my heart, and the first one, uh, you know, it's just how great God is or how how much we walk in life with him. And he's always beside us and we forget. So let's just keep that in mind as, as we enjoy these. And sing along if you know them, please. <laughs>
that she was a uh, uh, respiratory therapist she went what she was driving all the way to Forsyth working in 12 hour shifts that's a long way to go and come back but the Lord's blessed her she's a teacher down at Wilkes now and the assumption is you're teaching respiratory therapy correct mm -hmm. well I tell you I'm on top of it today <laughs> <laughs> so she's a blessing and Pray for her. She's married to Josh Johnson, so if y'all know him, whew, he's a bird. But we, we appreciate you. It's beautiful. Chad, you come on, brother, and do what the Lord tells you to, and be good. Yeah. I had a set of lungs like she had, I could preach for hours. <laughs> We're glad you know. Amen to that. I think my wife said that too. Uh, well, I appreciate y'all letting me come back. <laughs> I was afraid I'd get a call from Wade earlier and say, don't worry about coming back. <laughs> uh, but we're going to finish up with uh, the Beatitudes this evening. We'll, we'll be back over in Matthew 5 and we'll pick back up at verse 7. And uh, just kind of see now where the Lord's leading us uh, as Christians and, and how we're to use uh, what he's gave us. He's given us all gifts. That's where we prime example right there. That's a, what a gift she has. We've all got talents and gifts, and we've all got something that we can give back to the church, the community, but uh, what's real important is what we give back to God. And so we're going we're gonna to finish up with Beatitudes and look at some things that he's given us and uh, I, I like to start out with little stories that kind of just breaks the ice a little bit, so I'm going to read you this real quick. It says, a logger got saved one Sunday night, and before he left the service, he spoke to his boss about how the other men were going to receive him at the sawmill. The following Sunday, he came back to church not really looking any worse than uh, for the wear. During his testimony, he talked about how he got saved the past Sunday, and he wondered how he'd be received at the logging camp. He went on to say things went much better than he expected. In fact, the men didn't notice anything different about me. I don't think they even found out I got saved. Think about that. It hurts, don't it? Got saved and nobody knew it. I tell you, now I got saved. October 26, 1997. I was raised in a 
great Christian home. Godly parents. Awesome church. I can't imagine being like that logger. Remember coming down, I come out about the third row back. I made my way up to Will as at Willowdale Baptist Church at the time, and I made my way up to this altar. I can't imagine not telling people what happened to me that day. I can't imagine I was in, in school then. I can't imagine not going back to school and telling them what took place. Much less going out to school or wherever I was going and people not seeing a change in me. And that's what me and Marie's talking about on the way here. We are talking about uh, one of the preachers up the road here from me she went to school with and how bad a person he was and the reputation that he had and the things that he was into and to see him now and to see a change. That's what it's about. Paul tells us that we become a new creature, a new creature in Christ. And so when we're saved, we get a new image. We get a new, uh, we get a new look. We get a new feel. We get, we just get new. We get new all over us. And and I cannot imagine being uh, like this fella here and and somebody not seeing a difference in me. There's some major differences between those who profess Jesus as Savior and those who don't. There's a big difference in the two of those. What what differences should be between the believers and the non-believers. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to try to tell you that this evening the best that I can. They're listening to the Beatitudes. We started out the first four this, uh, this morning. We'll start the last, or you know, finish up the last four here in a minute. But this should help us be able to see the difference in the two types of people. We have the non-believers and the believers. We have the, the I'll say the atheists and the Christians, if you want to go that route. But there's, there's two groups of us. And those two groups have a huge difference between them. One has heaven as their home. The other, bound for hell. That's a, that's a big difference. One has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The other has rejected Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at, uh, again, the last four parts of the Beatitudes. And again, I'm going to try to recap this morning for just a second. This morning went through the first four that dealt with our relationship with God. Now, the final four are going to deal with our relationship with each other. And if you see the way that that worked out, I'll try to make this as clear as possible. If you're going to have a relationship with one another, if you're going to have a relationship with the church, if you're going to have a relationship with the community, if you're going to have a relationship with anyone else, you first got to have a relationship with God. Amen. If you ain't got a relationship with God, you ain't going to have a relationship with nobody else. If you're going to have a relationship, it ain't going to be a good one with anybody else. I'll just say it like that. You've got to have Jesus in your heart before you can ever love anybody else. You've got to love Jesus before you can really, truly love someone else. I, if you go back to the, the times before you were saved, I know a lot of people don't want to go back there. But don't you think about how it was before you were saved and the kind of person that you was. Think about the way that you loved people, or did you love people? <clears throat> probably not. You probably loved yourself more than anybody else. That's one of the big changes when it comes to Salvation is you learn to not love yourself. And it's it's that you learn to love everyone else. Everybody becomes your neighbor. And you're to love your neighbor. But ponder on that just a second. You've got to have a relationship with God before you can have that relationship with anyone else in this world. And you can there's a couple other things I'll, I'll point out real fast. First, this morning we uh, shows us how to, to deal um, with what it means to be a Christian. Remember I told you it wasn't all biscuits and gravy. Remember that. And then second, what we're going to talk about tonight is how a Christian should behave. That's, that's, that's tough right there. I remember during my ordination service, uh, Preacher Derek Wilson was doing the ordination service, and I had my little Bible out there. And he, he hollered at me and Maria, and he said, you got a highlighter. And no, I don't, I don't carry a highlighter for my Bible. Typically, I'm behind the pulpit, and I ain't got time to highlight anything. So I remember some lady pitching one over to us and highlighting. He was explaining not so much how to be a, a preacher and it, it trying to explain what was in the Bible about it, uh, being a preacher, but how to live a Christian life. We're not taught that much. We don't talk about the Christian life much. I think a lot of people rely on 
uh, self. They would rely on themselves to teach them how to be a Christian, how maybe to read the Bible a little bit or how to, to give their testimony every now and then. But we don't talk about how to be a Christian. And the Beatitudes that we're going to be reading today, that's going to help us. It's going to help each one. It's only four of them, the last four. But it's going to help you more than you'll ever uh, imagine when you get into those last four of the Beatitudes here. The first four focus on person's needs, and the, the last four is going to talk about the person's responsibility. I don't know if you know this or not, but as a Christian, you have a responsibility. You have a great responsibility. You have, uh, like me and Brother Wade, we've got the greatest responsibility in the world. We have a higher calling than the president. It is a calling from God. You cannot go above what we've been called to do. It is an honor to be called to preach. It really is. As a Christian, you're called to do something as well. <coughs> be Christ-like. Be a disciple. Use your skills. Use your talents. Whatever he's given you. You're called to use that and to do something with that to glorify his name and to help build up his kingdom. So we're going to look at those this evening as well. Those four things that we are to do as Christians, we're called to do. If you got your Bible open to Matthew 5 again, uh, we're going to finish out verse 7 through 12. If you will, stand with me in just a moment. It won't take long, I promise. I said no preacher ever. <laughs> the Bible said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's pray. Father, this evening as uh, we come back to your house, Lord, we just thank you again. Uh, for open doors. Lord, we thank you for uh, what you're doing here in this community. We thank you for what you're doing here in this church. And Lord, I pray that this evening that all that's said and done would honor you. Uh, Father, we just want to thank you for uh, Sister Tori for that voice that you've given her and for allowing her uh, to continue to, to praise your name. Uh, Father, it's, uh, it was an honor to hear it. And I pray, Lord, that you bless her for her time and her talent. And Lord, just thank you again for this church and, and those that make it up, for Brother Wade, uh, for his passion, his desire to continue to build up the kingdom. Father, I pray that you bless this church greatly for their endeavors and for where they stand on your word. And I pray, Lord, you'd be with us this evening as we go back into your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just touch hearts and touch minds, Lord. And I pray for a great movement and a great uh, feeling of the Holy Spirit today. Lord, again, we just thank you for your many blessings. All your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Blessed are the merciful. Verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, one of the first things required of a Christian is that that mercy. We don't talk about mercy that much. We talk about God's good grace and God's mercy. But what about us as Christians? We are to show mercy as well. Once we're saved, we are to start showing mercy. Mercy is a sense of pity, and it's a desire to, to uh, relieve that suffering. So the best way I can put this, if you're one of those math nerds, would be pity plus action equals mercy. Pity plus action equals mercy. We have got to have mercy towards one another. What's the one thing we say uh, a lot in our lives? Lord, have mercy. And don't we say that a lot? Lord, have mercy. Oh, how about Chad, have mercy? What about Wade, have mercy? I don't know anybody else's name, so I'll just stop there. Have mercy. That's hard to do. Have mercy on somebody. When they've done you wrong, have mercy on them. When they've said something against you or about you, have mercy on them. Forgive them. It's hard to do in this life. Just being emotionally moved by a story or something, it's not, it's not being merciful. Just letting something move you a little bit, that's not showing mercy towards anyone. Those who take pity and don't act on it are saying, and I heard a preacher say this one time, he said, I'm too heavenly minded to be of earthly value. <laughs> I'm too heavenly minded to be of earthly value. Wow. That'll make you curl your toes right there. He's right. 
you don't have action, if you don't put action behind your mercy, that's your thinking. You're too heavenly minded to have any earthly value. Now, the Good Samaritan, it's a, it's, that's a, probably one of the best examples that we can have of this. And I want to read this to you. I know you all know it. You probably don't want to hear it again, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Over in uh, Luke 10, 25, it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And thy neighbor as thyself. And here's where it gets good. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? I love that story right there. When I I, I worked for Samaritan's Purse for 10 years, and that was a right at 10 years. And that was one of the things, when I walk in the mornings, my, I was in a three-story building, big building. And you walk in in the mornings for devotion, the very first thing you see as you walked in the main door was a huge pain. Of the Samaritan, and he's bandaging up this injured man, and it was one of the greatest to walk in and see that it was one of the greatest reminders of who your neighbor is and how we are to treat our neighbors. Now we don't have we got some pretty good neighbors for the most part over our way, but it's hard. It's hard to love them sometimes. Really hard to like them a lot of times, but it's really hard to love them sometimes for the way they act and things they do. But he's telling us right here, we are to love our neighbors. We are to have mercy. We are to show pity towards those that are hurt. I'm not talking about hurt uh, physically, but how about emotionally hurt? How about spiritually hurt? How about 2020? How many of y'all got hurt during 2020? How many of y'all got your heart hurt just a little bit? How many times did you get up on a Sunday morning and all you want to do is come and be with your church family and you couldn't make it? Last year was a year of broken hearts. I ain't talked to a preacher yet. Didn't have his heart broken. Ain't nothing worse than wanting to get up, see your congregation, hug their neck. I'm so sick of fist bumps, elbow bumps. I want to hug somebody. I want to shake somebody's hand. Amen. I want to get down here on this altar and cry with them. Wrap my arm around them. We're to show pity. We're to show mercy for those that are hurting. Every chance you get, you try to bind up somebody's wounds. Every opportunity you have, you show mercy. Is that what God does to us every single day? He shows us grace. He shows us mercy. I don't deserve either one, nor his love. But we get it anyway. So why not return that back to those that are around us? Why not show that love and that grace and that mercy to those that are around us, to our neighbors, to the one that's in the ditch, to the one that lost their spouse, to the one that lost their job, to the one that can't put, provide for their family? Why not show a little bit of grace? Why not show a little bit of mercy? Why not show a little bit of Jesus back to your neighbor and see what happens. Brace yourself for a blessing when you do that. And again, I, I, I won't talk much about this, but it, 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 you got to throw out there the left hand and right hand as well. You go out and you show grace, you show mercy, you show love. Don't you jump back on social media real fast and say, oh, look what I did for so-and-so. Don't you get on the phone and, and, and call or 
put the love of Pete, don't put me in a group chat. Oh, I just said that. I will block your number and I'll be. Yes, bro, sorry. Don't you get up there and start bragging about what you did. You will lose every blessing that God had in store for you. Do not brag about it. I preached on that not too long ago at the church. We see people as people once we're saved. When we're saved, we have a new vision. We have new eyes. And we see people in a different light than we've ever seen before. We see people as people. And we don't view people the way that we used to. We see changes. We're changed. You see people as, here's what you see. You'll start to see people as victims of Satan. When you get new eyes, you're going to see what the devil's doing. That you, It's been going on the whole time. You just didn't see it because you had uh, ungodly eyes. But when you get saved, you get to see a side of the devil that you've never seen before. And it will break your heart. You're going to get to see the devil working in somebody's life. And it's going to make you nauseous. It'll make you sick. Because of this new vision that you have. And so you're going to want to help somebody. You're going to want to show that mercy towards somebody. Our attitude in this life right now as Christians should be just like the Samaritan's attitude. Act without judgment and have great love and great mercy towards your neighbor. Luke 6.36 says, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Well, that'll get you right there. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. The Bible says that those who are merciful will be shown mercy. And I thank God for that. I thank God for his mercy. And like I said, I don't deserve it. Ain't one of us deserves it. I don't deserve his grace, but we get it. The Lord knows I don't deserve his love, but he still has it for me. And I'm going to take it. Every chance I get, I'm going to take it. Just as much as we need to be merciful, be the, need the, the merciful hand of God, Others around us need us to extend our hand of mercy as well. So when you're out and about, whatever you do for a living, wherever you live in this in this community or this county, wherever you're at, extend that hand of mercy. Be like that Samaritan and, and reach down and give them that hand. I, I love the, the story of Peter walking on water. And for a brief moment, he's able to get out there on the water with Jesus. But what did he do? his eyes off Jesus. But what did Jesus do? He still reached down. I, just, I love that image in my head. I just, yeah, yeah. He, just, he just reached down and he got him. He just reached down there and he grabbed him by the hand. That's us. That, that's the picture of mercy. He, he reaches out that hand of mercy for each one of us and he pulls us in. And he grabs us and he holds on to us. Now, in my mind, he gets Peter up on the boat and he wears his tail out. That's the way I see it. Or he takes him over to the shore and he wears him out and says, why'd you take your eyes off on me? But that's just the way I like to see it. Jesus would have done that, I know. That's what I've done. I took a stick and beat him with it. Why'd you take your eyes off of me? Why did you, why, why? I mean, these guys, they had no idea what they were, what they were experiencing in that short three years, three and a half years they was with him. Had no clue what they had in front of them. Why take your eyes off Jesus? He reaches down that hand of mercy for us. We need to do the same thing for one another. Reach down that hand of mercy for one another. Number two, blessed are the pure at heart. Verse 8 tells us, read back over here. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The biblical definition of pure, I love this definition. There's all kinds of definitions of pure out there, but I like the biblical one. Simple, true, or genuine. Simple, true, or genuine. I like it. That's, that's pure. That's what that means. Now, if you look at this, Jesus shifts our attention from charity to purity. From mercy, from giving to purity. How does, or what does he mean by a pure heart? Pure heart. That's a tough one. I think about children when I think about a pure heart. They get to an age, and I believe they lose that pure heart. But there is an innocence in a small child. And that's what I think of when it comes to a pure heart. 
They don't know. They don't know anything. You have these little babies, and they're just as innocent as they can be. They're, they're so sweet and cuddly, and they make noises. And then they turn 15 and start dating, and they grow up. They grow up. <laughs> sin on a scale? Don't we have bad <coughs> sins and, and good sins? That don't, is that how we look at it? Oh, I stole a pencil. That's, that's not a bad sin. But you murder somebody, that's a bad sin. What's, what's a sin in God's eye? It's the same. Sin is sin in God's eye. And so I look at these children and I look at them and that's, that's my image of a pure heart. Is it as like a newborn child. If we contain purity of heart, then it's almost a guarantee that the rest of us is going to be pure as well. We've got to have a, a, a clean, and that's what pure is, clean. Now think about gold. Well, how, do you get, how do you get the gold that makes your jewelry? You just dig it up out the ground and beat it a little bit with a hammer? And, no. It goes through a, a frying process. You've got, to, you've got to heat it up. You've got to get the impurities out of it. It's got to go under fire. It's got to be under flame. To burn out the bad stuff. To get the dirt, the debris, and all the earth matters out of it so that it becomes pure gold. Pure gold. So we've got to have that pure heart. And if you don't have a pure heart, uh, I'm going to tell you something right now. You're not going to be a pure person. You've got to have that pure heart. Now, the opposite's also true. If a person's heart is impure, then you can be assured the rest of them is going to be impure as well. And that's not where we want to be. Listen to what Jesus says over in Mark 7. He says, And he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Sounds like work of the devil, don't it? That is what that is. The devil has his way. The devil, he has a heyday with us sometimes. And that's when we get that impure heart. That's when all the impurities that are in our heart that start to show, that start to come out. We've got to burn them out. We've got to get under fire. We've got to get purified. When I say get under fire, we've got to get back in the Word of God. We've got to let the Word of God purify us and and, and burn that nasty stuff out of us that the devil has placed in us. And it can be through watching TV, being on the computer, being out in society, dabbling with things in, in this world that we shouldn't be dabbling with. Friends. Friends. You better watch yourself. There, you, some of y'all don't really have friends. You might call them a friend, but they ain't a true friend if they're getting you into sin. If they're getting you into bad stuff. If you want to clear out your friends list, you become a preacher. <laughs> you lose them all, don't you? <laughs> it's okay. We just purified our friends list. <laughs> Pure heart. Remember that. What kind of, of eternal purity does Jesus have in mind for each one of us? Now, I want you to think about this for a second. A pure heart is a heart without defilement, and it's not contaminated. No defilement is not contaminated. The things of this world contaminate us. I'm not talking about you drinking water. I'm talking about the things that we see. It's, I tell you what, technology, we talk about things being a blessing and a curse. That's technology. I will have to say last year, it actually was a blessing. We were able to, to do what y'all are doing here. It's the same thing at Chestnut. They were able to live stream and, and never, we never missed a Sunday from the end of March, all the way up until we come back in the church, we never missed a day. Not one Sunday. I was able to come to church, preach. We had a camera, a couple guys there helping. Put the CPR mannequins in place throughout the pews. <laughs> Almost ordained them as deacons. <laughs> Almost that close. Amen. <laughs> Last year, technology was a blessing. And it still is. We're seeing people watching 
our service, I mean, Brother Wade's talked about this, people are, are watching services that don't normally come to church. That is awesome. I love it. But technology also can be that curse. Technology has probably ruined more marriages than anything else here recently. Technology has brought more sin in the homes than we know what to do with now. Technology, my pastor always said was of the devil until last year, and now things have changed a little bit. But we've got to be careful. We can allow things of this world to come in and contaminate our hearts so that they're not pure anymore. And if, if our hearts are contaminated, folks will see that. And it's going to affect you the way it's spiritually, uh, emotionally. It's going to affect you. It can affect you physically if you ain't careful. A pure heart is a clean heart that's free from dirt. Purity is more than the absence of dirt, though. It's the presence of good things. And that's what, I think that's how the gold works, is that when you when you purify it, when it goes under fire, and, and it's getting all the bad stuff out of it, it's introducing oxygen to it as well at some point. And, and it makes it more valuable. I think that's how that works. I don't do it thing with rocks. Gold. I wear a rubber ring. <laughs> Safer that way. But when we try to purify things, we need to be replacing the dirt and the debris and things that's in, in our hearts with good things. If we push out the bad things and allow the good things in, the good things will show. The gold gets shiny polish it up a little bit. Your heart gets shiny because you're polishing up a little bit. When you're studying the Word of God, when you're in there uh, in the morning doing your devotions or, or in the evenings when you just sit down with your cup of coffee or whatever you do in the evenings and, and you just read the Word of God for just a little bit, you're polishing up your heart. You're purifying that heart and it's getting a little bit more shiny, a little bit more shiny. Every single day we're being bombarded with the filth of this world. Every single day. One of the greatest things that we've done at home We've got rid of cable TV or satellite. We don't have it no more. That's been a blessing. We got a Roku, Netflix, and all the land grip that you can imagine. That's all that matters. And that's fine. When you when your ten year olds watched every episode, what was it, seven times? Maybe and she can quote it just like any other. And that's fine. It tickles me to death. I'm alright with that. We as parents, as adults, I think we're having to protect our children a lot more now than we ever thought we'd have to. You know, back back when I was younger and in school, we just had to worry about maybe a bully. That's about it. But now we've got to deal with a lot of other things that can be brought into the home. And so we've got to protect our children and keep their hearts as pure as possible. They're seeing things right now in second, third grade. I didn't see those in high school. And it's that bad right now. And so we've got to protect our children. Church, it's up to us. To keep protecting our children. Keep doing what you're doing here in the community. Keep doing what you're doing with your youth groups. Keep doing what you're doing to protect their little hearts. And keep their hearts as pure as possible. Because it don't take much in this world right now. They can see one thing or two things at the school or at home and absolutely ruin them. Ruin their reputation. It can just ruin them. Now is it realistic for us to think it's possible to be pure? Do you think you can be pure? I'll say this, in the world we live in right now, it's not easy. Again, it, there's a lot of things out there that make it hard on us. But we can. And like I said this morning, we can do a lot, of, a lot of things on our own, but there are certain things we can't do on our own. And keeping your heart pure is one of them. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. You've got to have Jesus or you cannot keep it whole. Or you cannot keep it pure. You cannot. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. And that's that. Y'all remember them cartoons when we was growing up and you had the little you had the little devil on one shoulder and the little angel on the other shoulder and they're talking and they're telling you what you could and couldn't do. You remember that? that was, those were good cartoons. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Telling you what's right and what's wrong. But he ain't on your shoulder, he's in your heart. And so we've got to continue to, to listen to the Holy Spirit. We've got to listen to that still small voice. And when things start getting bumpy and, and we're starting to to mess with sin and all these things in our lives, we've got to listen to that still small voice when it says, get away. Back away from it. Stay away from that. That's, that's not good stuff right there. That's, that's impure stuff. Worldly erosion, morals and values, things like that, we're, we're seeing it right now. We're seeing the world eroding the moral values inside our churches, inside our homes. 
Folks, God's been, everybody complains about God being taken out of school. Well, first and foremost, God was never taken out of school. That's just a lie straight out of hell. I teach Bible stuff all the time in schools, and it's fine. That's just one of those rumors. But what's really sad is this. God's been taken out of the homes. Now, I ain't worried about the school. The school's fine. God's been taken out of the homes. That's where all our problems are coming from. That's where the problems are stemming from in this world. It's what's going on at home. When you get God back in, in the homes, let me just say this right here. I might step on a toe or two here, but I'm going to be really honest with you. Men, it's our fault. It's our fault. We are the head of that house. If we don't stand up on the Word of God, if we don't start instilling the Word of God in our children, look at what's going on around us right now in this world. It's our fault. It's the man's fault in the house. We got to stand up. We got to be stronger in what we believe in. We got to get God back in the home. When we get it back in the home, then we're going to see it back in our schools, in our workplace. We're going to get. Hey, believe it or not, you get to see God back in church. But it's going to start at home, or it ain't going to start nowhere. We got to get God back in our houses. We got. I don't know what y'all have here when it comes to, to men's meetings and things like that. But those are great things when you can get a brotherhood together. And you can keep doing your Bible studies or whatever it is, or fellowshipping in general. That's a great one right there, just fellowshipping in general. That strengthens our feelings, and it strengthens the, our relationship with one another, and it strengthens, strengthens our relationship with God. Now, you can't do it on your own. I said that earlier. And I, I, I just I want to reemphasize that. We've got to rely on God to pur purify our hearts. Only he can do it. It's through him we'll be purified. And the third thing uh, in verse 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. This deals with a Christian's social responsibility. And I know we use this a lot. And that, uh, a couple weeks ago when, uh, when Brother Chris and, and, and Logan was killed back home, that was the first verse I think everybody started posting out there. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They are. I won't take away from that. But, but that's not exactly what this scripture is talking about. It's not talking about law enforcement officers. Uh, and I ain't going to take away from him. I love Chris to death. I've known Chris pretty much my whole life. His dad's one of the finest pastors I've ever met. But that's not exactly where Jesus was going with this. He's talking about our, our social responsibility. How does my faith impact the world around me? How does my faith impact everything that's around me? How does my faith impact my family and my friends? That's a good question. How does your faith impact the world around you? How does your faith impact your friends and family? Like I said this morning, can they see Jesus on you? Because you may be the only Bible somebody ever reads. How does your faith impact those around you? We need some kind of understanding of what it means to be a peacemaker, though. A peacemaker is not someone who sells for peace regardless of the cost. A peacemaker is a person is not a person that brushes the issue under the rug. Y'all ever met somebody like that? They don't like conflict. My boss will like that, and he'll flat out tell you. I hope he's listening. He'll tell you that. He don't like conflict. He will sweep it under the rug just to get away from it. I don't, nobody likes conflict. I've never seen anybody just kind of run into conflict, but that's not a peacemaker. Somebody that just brushes it under the rug or just ignores it, that's not a peacemaker. That's not somebody that's, that's doing what God has called us to do. Being easygoing, being passive, that's, that's not... A peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who is ready to pursue peace and pay the price if necessary. We want to keep the peace. No, that's what a Christian wants to do. We want to keep the peace. One of the greatest things we, we I don't know how long it's been going on, but we always talk about having peace. How, why can't we all get together? Why can't we have peace in the world? That's what we want. That's what this world wants. That's what as Christians, that's what we want. Peace. Nothing but pure, flat-out peace. We don't want war. We don't want strife. 
We don't want fighting. We don't want that. We just want peace. Those that want peace and do something about it, those are peacemakers. Those that want great things for their neighbors, for their country, for their community, those are peacemakers. Do they wear a badge? No. Some of them probably do, but do we wear a badge? No. We want peace. We want peace on earth. That's what we want. We are all peacemakers. If we can step up, get outside these four walls, and go love on people, and show them the love of Jesus everywhere that we go, then we're bringing peace with us. Now, is everybody going to go for it? No. Not everybody. If you jump out here and run down Dollar General and start cramming tracks down somebody's throat, they're, go they're not going to turn. They're going to turn and run from you. They're not going to turn to Jesus. They're going to scare them away. When, the, when I worked at, at Samaritan's Purse, there's a, an older preacher that worked there at the World Medical Mission. I love that man's dad. And when I was called to preach, I just had to start working at SP. And he told me something, and to this day I'll hang on to it. He said, he said, a congregation's a lot like chickens. I thought, oh, where's this going? If you've ever raised chickens, and it, it makes sense if you've ever raised chickens, he said, if you take a handful of feed, you pick it up out of that bucket and you throw it at them chickens, what are you going to do to them? You're going to scatter them. So if you take that bucket of feed and you reach down there and you just lay it out for them, they're going to follow you. He said, that's just like preaching. He said, if you take the word of God and you throw it at them as hard as you can, you're going to scare them off. But he said, if you lay it out there for them, they'll come. That's the same thing with being a peacemaker. If we go out there and we fling the word of God at everybody we come in contact with, we're going to scare them off. But if we're gentle with them and we feed it to them gently, they're going to keep following. You, you guys just keep backing up and before you know it, Warrensville Baptist Church is going to be packed. That's what you want. That's what we want. We want to see peace. And peace can start in your homes. Peace can start right here in the church. But we're, we're all peacemakers. Now, at times, peace is costly, like the grace of God. God was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice by his son, Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate sacrifice right there, the death of his son. It was costly, and it wasn't achieved overnight. It took some time. It took a lot more than the 33 and a half years that he is here. It took a lot of time for things to come to fruition and for things for prophecy to be fulfilled. A lot of time, but it happened, and we got that peace. Think about World War II. What's one thing that the world wanted during World War II? Peace. Hundreds of thousands of men had to die, though, for us to have peace. Now, are we at peace right now? No. Maybe we're back at it again. We're still warned. We'll always be warned. There's always going to be a few going on somewhere around the world. If it ain't between. Uh, Two Indian nations, it's going to be between two tribes. If they're between two tribes, it's going to be between two countries. It's always going to be a war somewhere. But we can continue to preach Jesus to those war torn countries and keep showing them the love of God everywhere we go. Now, there's three parts of peace, or what I like to call the peace triangle. I would like to call it the fire tetrahedron, but it is not. Fire triangle. Because fire triangle, we take one away and the fire goes out. First thing, we've got to have peace in home. Peace in our homes. I talked about this a while ago. We've got to have peace in our homes. We've got to have it with our family. If you can't keep peace at home among your family, then chances are you're going to have a hard time keeping peace at work or at school. And I, I, I hate to use my youngins like this again, but I have to because I mean, that's what preachers do. We always use our youngins as examples. You want somebody to kill the spirit on a Sunday morning? <laughs> you put two youngins in the back seat together and can't stand each other sometimes. <laughs> At each other's throat. And I get to church and I just want to repent right there on the spot <laughs> for the things that went through my mind. <laughs> we got to have peace in the car before the preacher can preach. <laughs> if you ain't got peace at home, you ain't going to get peace nowhere else. I want you to think about your life at home. 
and then the way it is when you get to work. If things are rocky at home, or things not rocky at work, our youngins, I'm not talking about just my youngins, if things are not good at home with kids, it makes for bad days at school. If things are not good at home for adults, things ain't going to be good at work for adults. It all starts at home. We've got to have peace at home before we can have peace anywhere else. Remember that peace. Now secondly, and that little triangle there is peace in the community. This is that love of neighbor that we're talking about. We've got to have peace in our community. We've got to love thy neighbor as much as possible. Romans 12, 18 says, this Paul says, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Whew. How? <coughs> Paul didn't live in 2021, did he? It's tough. It is tough. I'm going to read it again. If, be, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Sounds pretty good until you have a gas shortage. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody's about to kill each other. Third, peace in society. Society doesn't always agree with biblical morals and values. I promise you that. The world we live in, they don't care about biblical values. They don't care about morals anymore. That That's out the window. Nobody cares. I, honestly, it ain't even being preached, in, and I, I'll get on this in a minute, but it's not even being preached much in, in our churches. It ain't being taught in our churches. It ain't being taught in our homes either. And that's why we're seeing such a downfall in our society. Now. That's why we're seeing things going on in our government's and I'm not talking about just the U.S. government. I'm talking about governments around the world. That's why we're seeing so, so much bad stuff going on in our, our world right now. It's because they have taken morals, biblical morals and values and they've just pushed them completely out the door. I love my country. I love my country to death. And I'm thankful I live in a country that was founded, our forefathers founded this country on biblical principles and morals and values. And Lord help us when our government completely turns away from it. They're, they're working on it right now. But just, if we ever get away from that, we better be praying really hard for the rapture. I don't know that he'll let us go through that, to be honest with you. I won't, I won't get on that though. We're called and expected by God to uphold it. Biblical morals and values. That's he called as Christians. We are to uphold that. And everywhere we go, no matter what you do, this is what you stand on. You take the word of God, and it might hurt some. You may have to stand on something that the rest of your friends or family doesn't like, but you stand on it because you know what's right. When it comes to things like these gay marriages or when it comes to abortion and it comes to, to who's behind the pulpit and who says what, who does what. You stand on this right here. Like they say, may hair lift the Pope, and that's all right with me. <laughs> he needs Jesus too. <laughs> Bible says the peacemakers will be called children of God. You try. You try to keep the peace. You try to be that peacemaker and we'll be called the children of God. Peacemakers reflect the work of Jesus who brought peace himself. That's the way I see him. I love, I love that, that uh, Palm Sunday when he rode in on that colt. I mean, you just see him coming down the road there and it just had peace written all over it. That's the way I see Jesus. We're talking about him being meek and mild this morning. That's the way I see Jesus riding in on that colt. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace. That's what we are to do. We are to bring peace everywhere we go. What an honor it is, though, to be called a child of the King right along the side of the Son of God. That's what we are as Christians. We are a child of the King. We are sons of God. What an honor to have that title, the same title as Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. We are the sons of God. Take that. Don't that just blow your mind? Well, that's, not, that's a privilege right there, folks. We can't take that lightly. Number four, last one. Verse 10 through 12 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. How be out of right here, if you'll notice how they progress from one to another, it's not by accident. Jesus planned that out. He, we, the, the preachers that get in and they study and they get ready for their sermons and, and they lay things out a certain way, Jesus laid that out just right for us. When he preached this message, he laid that out just right for us, every one of us. I'm not sure if you noticed it before, but it, it went from peace to persecution really fast. Peace to persecution. That's two different things. That's drastic. We don't like to talk about persecution. Nobody wants to talk about persecution. We talk about persecution in the Bible, and we're, we're looking at being hung upside down on the cross and getting our heads cut off and getting bowled alive and flayed alive. And we look at all the bad stuff when it comes to persecution. We ain't seen that here yet. What do we get? Oh, he's a Christian. Oh, he goes to Warrenful Baptist Church. That, that's the that's the extent of our persecution. It's just a little little mad mouthing. That's our persecution. We ain't seen nothing yet. The locks of what they seen back in, in the New Testament. Jesus doesn't want his disciples to get the impression that Christian the Christian life is biscuit and gravy. That's not what he and I, I would never tell anybody that. Anybody that comes to know Jesus, I would not tell them it's a smooth road from here. You ain't got nothing to worry about when you come to Jesus. I could do I, that. That make me lie. I'm not going to lie to somebody when they've just got things right with Jesus and say, "Whew, man, welcome to our side. It's smooth sailing from here." Unfortunately, you have to tell them pretty quick. It's going to get rough. It's going to get rough. The devil done lost another one, and he's pretty mad at you right now. So brace yourself. He's going to throw things at you. You're going to see things you didn't know existed. But you got Jesus on your side now. you got a family on your side now. You've got prayer support on your side now. You've got brothers and sisters in Christ on your side now. You've got things on your side now you didn't even know existed. And you just be like Peter. And you be like Jesus. When that devil gets to confront you and he starts throwing them little darts at you and you just say, get behind me, devil. Tell him to get behind you. But it ain't going to be easy. We have these, I can't even call them preachers. I don't know what you call them right now. Out there, and, and you'll see people, and they try to paint these, these pictures of Jesus. says, come to Jesus, and it's all peaches and cream. Come to Jesus, and he's going to wipe away all your sin, and all your suffering, and all your sin, and all go away. Come to Jesus. That's all you got to do. If you'll come to Jesus, he'll get you a Mercedes. If you'll come to Jesus, he'll pay your house off. If you just come to Jesus, everything will be all right from here on out. Well, I'll be honest with you. That's the gospel according to Joel Osteen, which is wrong. That man needs Jesus worse than Pope, I think. That is the wrong way. They have sugar-coated the gospel to a point where there is no gospel. They have sugar-coated everything. They've turned it into a show. I, I won't get on the soapbox on this one, but they've turned churches into... Nothing but a big show anymore. You sing for 45 minutes and preach for five. You do the 7-Eleven songs, seven words repeat 11 times, and the preacher gives a short devotion and you go home. There is no gospel in that. There's no sin in that. I'll be honest with you, I bet they had had conviction in that church in a long, long time. Because all they want is nickels and noses. They want numbers in the pews, and dollars in the plates. That's all they want. They're not in it for the reason we're in it. We're here to see people saved. Preach the gospel. Convict your hearts. Convict my heart. That's what we're called to do. Not them. They're not called. It's all about prosperity gospel. True discipleship of Jesus is costly. It will cost you. I'm not talking about your pocketbook either. It's going to cost you. Like I said, it ain't just preachers that lose friends. When you're called to preach, yeah, we're going to lose some. But one of the greatest things that will happen to you when you're saved is your friends get weeded out. And they're no longer your friends. To be honest with you, they weren't your friends in the first place. The best thing to happen to you is for you to weed out your friends and get with good, godly people. 
This is your family. Your congregation, these are your friends. These are the ones that you're going to call when somebody's sick and in the hospital and you need prayer. One, one, I don't know what y'all have over here. Do you, do you use call tree over here? Is that what y'all use? I love that. I absolutely love call tree. We had it when I was at Beach Valley and we, we've got it up Chestnut Dale now. I love that. A couple clicks, one little phone call or something like that. Prayer start. Just like that. Prayer start. That ain't a gossip line. That's prayer. That's getting prayer out quickly. I like that. But true discipleship is very costly. I'll start chasing squirrels if I'm not careful. <laughs> For Jesus and his disciples, it involved suffering and persecution by others who didn't agree with their faith. Jesus himself, his family. The Bible tells he came to his own and his own received him not. He's persecuted by his family. The disciples, every one of them, persecuted. And it didn't stop with just the disciples. On down the line, you go through history and you look at, at, at Christians, you look at all the preachers down the line, or just Christians in general. What happened to them? There was persecution. Some of them were martyred. It's not easy. It does have a cost. Just so we get it, though, Jesus, he repeats himself here in verse 11 and 12. He says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say, all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He keeps going. He says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Nowadays, people don't want to hear about the cost of being a Christian. They just want the benefits. Don't tell me. Don't tell me about the cost. Just tell me about the perks. Tell me about the benefits. Tell me about the good things that come with it. Not the cost. We stand up here and just keep preaching. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. Not many people is going to come. Jesus. But if we preach about love and we show grace and we show mercy and we preach that that's what Jesus is going to give us is grace, love, and mercy. That's not sugarcoating the gospel. But we've got to work it in there that it's going to get rough sometimes. We have to. We got to, got to be honest with them. Church. Again, they sugar coat the gospel and they present it as a cheap product just to get people coming in. I mean cheap like dollar general cheap product. They present the, they present Jesus as made in Taiwan or China or Korea or wherever else. That's how churches are presenting him now. Just a, a cheap packaged product. They sell Jesus the way that's attractive. That's what they want. Just an attractive Jesus. Come to this man. See what he can do for you. Let him get you a new car. That ain't how my Jesus works. And he never will. That's not what he has in mind for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to help us. He wants to give us the things that we need, not want. That's what he wants for us. He wants to love on us. I don't know where they found that or what version of the Bible they're using to find that mess, but I've never read Mercedes in my King James. I'm sorry. It's not in there. I don't I've never read where he's gonna pay off all my loans. Pay off my credit cards. But I have read where he said he'd love me and he'd never forsake me and he'd never leave me. That's good enough for me. I don't care if I never get a nice fancy car. fact that he said that he'd never leave me nor forsake me, that's good enough for me. I've got a friend I'll never lose. I've got a brother that said he'd never leave me or forsake me. Salvation is free, but discipleship is costly. But the rewards are great. The rewards are out of this world. They're heavenly. The Bible says, Blessed are they which are persecuted, for they will receive the kingdom of heaven. We're to rejoice when we're persecuted because we know our reward. We are to rejoice because we know we have a citizenship in heaven. I've got my passport. It's stamped and ready to go. Brother Wade, you don't have to fly. You don't have to get on that plane. I think I told him one time, my grandma refused to fly. She said, it's biblical. Jesus said it over Matthew. He said, lo, I'll be with you always. You know, get that it's L-O, not L-O-W. He said, he ain't with you if you're in the airplane. Grandma, you're a lot closer to it. 
whenever I fly a lot, or did, and uh, when I was when I worked at Samaritan's first, I was a travel manager. So we get new employees on, and they'd say, "Where's the best place to sit on a plane?" And I've got a, a morbid sick sense of humor sometimes, and I would say, "The back." Because I've never seen a plane back in the mountain before. <laughs> <laughs> then I get fussed at. They don't take that very funny. <laughs> Matthew tw uh, seven twenty one says, "Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the, doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven." Many will say to me in that day, "Lord, Lord, have we not?" prophesied in thy name and in thy name hath cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then will I profess unto them I never knew you depart from me when you look at this as a whole you can see that not everyone is going to go to heaven and that's sad as a preacher that's that's what we want to see everybody goes to heaven I'd love to be able to go outside these walls and never meet a person that's going to hell. But unfortunately, I'll meet some tomorrow probably. The day after that. The day after that. There's going to be people going to hell. Unfortunately, not everyone who says they're a Christian are a Christian. They say it. One that really drops me is to say, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? Well, I go to church. You believe in Jesus? Well, I got confirmed when I was 12. I got baptized when I was 12. You believe in Jesus? Well, I went to church my whole life. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Sadly, a lot of the ones that say they're Christian are not. Being born again believer is not just a title that we wear. It's not just some badge that we pick up off the floor and put it on our shirt. Don't hand them things out up here. You don't just come up to the altar, come up to the table here and grab a badge that says Christian and put it on it and walk out into the world and say, here I am, I'm a Christian. There's a lot of work goes in behind it. A lot of work goes in behind that. Being Christian involves a set criteria that we just went through with the, uh, the Beatitudes and others. The whole, I mean, right here is a, this is, you guys ever had a new employee guidebook? When you start work, this is it. As a Christian, this is your new employee guidebook right here. Some people call it a road map. Some call it a love letter. You call it whatever you want to. But that's a handbook right there on how to be a disciple. How to make disciples. How to love one another. How to extend that mercy. How to show grace. How to be a good neighbor. That's your instruction manual right there. For each one of us to take. That's our guidelines. It's not just because I say I'm a Christian. We gotta live that Christian life. We gotta show Jesus everywhere we go. It involves a solid relationship with Him. Not just a relationship, it is a solid, rock solid relationship with Jesus. Once we have that solid relationship with Him, then we'll start seeing great things take place in our lives and the lives of others. But it starts with Him. If you ain't got a relationship with God, you ain't going to have a relationship with anybody else. I'll promise you that. Brother Wade, it's all yours. Let me see if you'll just play for us. Tonight, is, if we'll just bow our heads and our hearts together here just for a few moments. While the message has been spoken tonight, combined with this morning, there's a lot of things to think about. If you're like me, you I write things down and I'll unpack this over the next day or two. So let's just let the Lord deal with our hearts right now. Altar's open if you'd like to come and pray. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. This would be a great night. There's a lot of people here can tell you how.
daily. Maybe you've been walking far from the Lord. Tonight you need to come back closer. This altar's open. Come and pray. The Lord has planted that on your heart. Just come and pray. May the Lord put somebody on your heart tonight. Maybe it's a son or daughter. Maybe it's a mom or dad. Come and pray. in our heart and kind of go through that period of honey, I'm never coming back to church again. And I never want to feel that way again. But the reason the Lord convicts our hearts is because He loves us. Amen. He doesn't want us to continue to live the way we've been living and making the choices we've been been making. Let's sing one more. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, Brother Larry Lewis, if you'll dismiss us in prayer, and we'll have some few moments of fellowship. But Chad, I appreciate you bringing God's Word. And uh, Corey, thank you so much for coming and singing. What a blessing. And, and Isaac and Lily and Haley. Why can I not remember that young man's name? But what a great job y'all did this morning. The choir sounded wonderful. But I tell you, if you leave here tonight without Jesus, just because you leave doesn't mean you can't stop and still get him. Amen. He's going to follow you. Holy Spirit's going to follow you. Ain't Jesus good? Amen. Amen.